This week, the world of social media treated us incredibly well, almost too well. First of all, we got some great news from Instagram and Instagram stories, to be specific. We're also going to look at more Twitter news. Yes, I know, it never ends. We're going to bring it back again with Emma's very famous praise burger. We're bringing some more new metas. And also, finally, we're going to look at some developments when it comes to ads and AI for Facebook ads potentially coming real soon. Hello team and welcome back to Old Marketing School. My name is Fab, founder and head teacher of the school. If you don't know this by now, you are still forgiven because you look lovely today and I'm not the only one looking lovely. Emma, hello. You look lovely too. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I think it's the best way to start or to end the week at this point, if you're listening when it comes out, is just to remind ourselves that we, you might have had a good week. You might have had a challenging week. You might have had a bit of a mid kind of in between the two week, but you got through the week. That's kind of how I see it. Thank you so much for being here with us again and for coming back. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. You know what? I was thinking about this. Today, we're going to jump into quite a few bits of news. And I realized that, as you know as well, because I always know that if I ask for Emma for, to find some cool things, there will always be something she comes back with, which I'm really <laughs> grateful for. I would have imagined that I know this is the end of May is not the middle of summer, but things would have slowed down a bit. And like the platforms will be like, you know what? We're going to chill. But I can't, we were talking before going on air, neither clients, nor people, nor apps are looking to stop. And like keeping up, kind of, I find it a bit of a struggle. I wanted to ask you actually, what is your favorite place to keep up with all of this news that comes up? Obviously, because that's the big thing that we do week in and week out. Yeah. Controversially, I get a lot <laughs> of my stuff from Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and we're going to talk about that later but I do there's some really awesome people Matt Navarra um, is a big I'm a big fan um, and I get a lot of my stuff from there but a big place that I do a lot of my research um, is TikTok yeah, <laughs> it's where I go we did talk about it last time you were on air if you if you missed it go back and catch up with that episode because we generally talked about actually how TikTok can become the place that you actually do your research whichever topic as well that's the problem or the positive of it it doesn't matter you will find something on TikTok wouldn't you 100% that's where I go and find inspiration creativity yeah to be honest, one of the things that I was thinking about is that TikTok has actually been, in the grand scheme of things, relatively quiet. But then also one of the reasons why I was thinking about this is because there have been a, quite a few announcements coming through good old Mark Zucky and all of his best friends, which I think it definitely overshadows when it comes to conversations, a lot of things. If we ignore the um, Elon like drama soap opera that keeps on coming, which will always bring people's attention back, I think. But one of the things that happened last week, at the end of last week, so we couldn't cover it on Friday, sadly, is actually a bit of good news for Social Media Manager, which is that Meta eventually is adding Instagram story posting as a capacity in its API. What what it means basically is the third party tools, the ones that you love can now, most of them can already facilitate posting and scheduling of stories without you having to add your own spin to it or having to post it manually. And a lot of people are excited and I wanted to add my two cents and I want to hear your opinion because I love to use stories in a way where almost these days is not even templates or kind of very polished I actually prefer to do it in a way that is almost like you use the create version of stories, which most of us will be familiar with. And either I repost some of the stuff that we do because I'm not ashamed to do that, but also I like to add then polls or maybe to add an element of interaction, especially for the school, if it's not my personal one. So I'm on the camp of actually, it's interesting and I think it's going to be really powerful, but I think some brands and managers and professionals will still benefit from actually posting natively. So I wanted to ask you your opinion, because that's kind of where my little flag that I'm going to raise. And that's how I see it, even if it is exciting. And I wanted to hear your thoughts about this as well. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I did talk about this last Friday uh, on my own channels. And I am of the opinion where I love it that it's a new feature. And I totally appreciate that it's going to help loads of people, loads of brands and businesses and creators. This will be really helpful for them. Um, and they can schedule stuff around specific events or offers or openings or any of those kind of things. And that's where I think it's great and it's super relevant. For me, I don't like it. I personally think that Instagram stories and how I use it um, for myself, I do it in the moment. 
So when I'm at events on the train, having a tea, doing something like this, I will do it in the moment. I do it through the app there and then live, adding all my locations and tags, that kind of stuff. So for me, Instagram stories is really just talking to my followers in the moment. Yes, I am one of those people that posts uh, puts a, a post in a story. I don't agree with Adam Masseri. I do think a lot of people want to see it. I haven't had any negative data from doing it. So I'm going to keep doing it till they take it away. So stories is great for that. And again, I, I do like it that they are listening to people and a lot of social media managers, this is going to help them save time. So uh, yeah, I'm kind of 50-50 about it. I love that you mentioned kind of what I was thinking as well when it came to it. And as you said, there can be a benefit for some people and it depends really on your strategy overall. I genuinely find that these days I look at it almost, which is probably what you're doing. How would I, how do I consume stories on a day to day myself? And I find that especially for people that either also use TikTok, but I would even say people maybe they're not super users of TikTok or are not social media managers, which means we're pretty active in a lot of places. You know, if you necessarily go back to Instagram first, I find that then when you think about it, your stories become almost a bit more of your TikTok. I think the thing with reels on Instagram, I would not necessarily go out of my way to watch as many of somebody that I really love, if that makes sense. You know, like when you get to the feed, you might get a bit distracted. But when we think about it, stories are very intentional. Because that's about what you're seeing. Obviously, the algorithm pushes people that you look at all the time. And in general, I think there is a lot more of that intention of willing to scroll and see what's in the behind the scenes. So as you said, the polished version of it, it kind of worked in what, 2018, 2019 is when we still, yeah. everybody was just kind of downloading Unfold and making super pretty things. And it still has a place. I genuinely don't think that's where the strengths lay. So I agree with you. And sorry, Adam, we love you, but I'm still going to reshare our stuff on stories because I don't give a damn. And um, again, it doesn't matter if then it doesn't drive as much traffic anyway, and it doesn't change anything. I still find that it helps me as a, cons as a consumer of the content. Because otherwise, most of the times I wouldn't know if somebody's posted something new because I probably wouldn't get to the end of that pile. So mm -hmm. I agree with you. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how people are going to adapt and use it, how many people are going to use it. My gut feeling is it's a bit too late. That said, we've got multiple links on Instagram. I'm sure you talked about it as well a couple of weeks ago. I did too. I'm happy with that. That's my win for the month when it comes to Instagram. That made me really happy. And then... Obviously, some of these things is all about understanding what you want to take and what you don't want to take. That's kind of how I see it. Now, Emma, you talked about a praise burger. Can you remind us again what a praise burger is before I share the next piece of news? <laughs> yeah, praise burger, or also known as a <clears throat> sandwich, um, is uh, you deliver a really great piece of news. That's your top bun. And then you have the uncomfortable bit. It's not for everyone, the meat in the middle, and then another bit of niceness, the uh, the bread on the bottom that brings it all together as a nice burger. So I think we've done the nice bit. We're now into the uncomfortable meat of today's discussion. Indeed, today we bring you some news that you might have seen already, so it's not too shocking. Thank you so much for explaining that. I think it's going to lead really well. There's actually one, two elements I want to talk about when it comes to Twitter. Yes, the soap opera is back. The one that hopefully will not last as long as most soap operas in the US, which is 20 plus years, but we will see. And this is actually, again, about some changes, unsurprisingly. And it's about the new CEO of Twitter, Linda Yaccarino. I had to check her name. I forgot to actually remind myself of her name. And it's been interesting. So I'm going to give you a couple of bits of stats as well within that, because I found that it was very interesting. So the piece of news obviously talks about her she apparently is very inspired by Elon's vision to create a brighter future, and she wants to help do that on the platform, which is going to be interesting to see. The reason why she was chosen, again, apparently, allegedly, was to help building Twitter into an everything app. No idea what that means. We might talk about that in a second. So this new leadership could honestly make or break the platform as we know it. And what was interesting is that by doing some digging, I actually found a relatively young study that kind of came on when basically post the takeover from Elon. That kind of shows already how things are changing on Twitter. So that's going to be interesting to see. Three stats that I love. This is about America. So it's in the US. And six to 10 Americans say they've taken a break from the platform for several weeks in the past 12 months. Women are more likely than men to say they've taken a break in such in said time. And also 67% of black users are more likely to have taken a break. And there's another one, apologies. 51% of Republican men are more 
most likely to say they use the platform in a year from now. So I found it really interesting that actually, again, from this study, we see a big shift in the US, how much users are using the platform and how much they need to use it in their day to day. We don't talk about whether they're super users, you know, what, what there's job roles at this point is more like a bit of a kind of stats ball. But I found it interesting. This obviously happened before this change in leadership, but part of me kind of wonders whether the change in leadership of paper is going to be enough to make people feel like things are going in the right direction. So what are your thoughts either from the stats or from the infamous everything app <laughs> new label that has been attached to Twitter? Yeah, I, I find those stats really, really interesting. And it's actually really great to to hear them now because that kind of makes sense to me. And I know we discussed at length um, in Twitter the last time I was on and you all know how I feel about it now. I'm, I'm animated about it. And that actually, all those stats are actually helping me understand now more about what I'm seeing on the app because I personally have def- not necessarily taken a break, but I've reduced the amount of time that I use Twitter. I don't, I'm not on it as much as I used to be. I don't, post as much as I used to. And that's also what I'm seeing. So I would imagine that the stats for the UK or Europe or or further outside of America would be very similar. Again, I don't know what everything means to Elon or, or to the new CEO, but just in the last couple of weeks, he's added all these new, very long form content options with the 10,000 word post and the two hour video if you're a blue subscriber. So I, I, I think he is trying to literally try and be YouTube, Facebook, Bebo, Meta, all, all in one, which is I would love to know if that's what people want. That's not what I want from Twitter. I loved the fact that it was short, snappy. That's where my community, my tribe was. And they're there less, which means I'm there less. So I can understand people taking a break. You know what I love that you mentioned there, aside from everything of... Actually, the fact that you reminded me of two platforms that have been making a bit of a stir, we don't know how long they're going to last. I'm going to say, I said it again a couple of weeks ago, but obviously Mastodon itself is the first one that comes to mind because it's a bit older, if you may, and the not so infamous Blue Sky as well. And what is the strength of this platform, regardless of their longevity, let's be honest, is the fact that they are literally, I think Blue Sky was dubbed the old Twitter or Twitter too. So literally it took what Twitter did best. And I've been talking about this a lot on this podcast, like for almost years at this point, platforms that really hone the one thing they do well and they do it well and they double down on it are the ones that you see also create a better experience for the users. Take TikTok, you know? And so for me, when, as you say, when you start adding, wanting to be everything, like the everything app and adding different formats and different things, your audience again can get relatively overwhelmed and also it just doesn't understand what they're supposed to do. I think one of the things that I learned early in running a business, multiple, or you could argue, um, is that if you don't make it easy for your audience or your, even your customers to understand what they're supposed to do, 90% of the time, they're not going to tell you, they are unsure, unless you build a rapport with them, they're just going to be confused. They just not show up or not do the thing because they don't know what they're supposed to do. And that's my fear. The more we add on top of, as you say, people not showing up in general, the people that maybe want to still be active, they're like, okay, I'm lost now. Why is everything changed? What can I do and what can I not do? It's a bit of a shame. My kind of prediction hat goes on and it's kind of like trying to figure out where people are going to be flocking to, if you want to use a good analogy there. LinkedIn comes to place in that respect. I still don't know. Like, I don't know what you love the most about Twitter. You mentioned it a bit uh, also last last time, but one of the things that I love the most is that it was just simple. Like that simplicity, like the text, like little things, you don't have to overthink it. And I find it was the least overwhelming or daunting one for me to post something that maybe I knew was not going to perform as well. But the five people that were like, oh, she's redoing her office. They were actually be kind of excited to see her. And I don't even know if I can do that, if I want to do that on LinkedIn, if that makes sense. You know, so it's kind of hard for me to think about which platform will people go to, whether we will scatter around, whether people will kind of go to the next platform based on their goals. And I kind of am worried that then we're going to lose one of the things that Twitter was good at, which was generally just keeping up with people and supporting people out. You know what I mean? I don't know if I'm just going a bit on like Fab is showing her age and she's kind of getting a bit old and grumpy, but that's how I feel about it because I care about Twitter, not maybe to, to that extent, but I do care about it too. And I, it would be a shame for us to lose that. And then you have to basically refine your network again. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, a hundred percent. I it was one of the easiest to use because it wasn't demanding a lot from you. You could like way back when it first started, you could write a sentence and that's what it was about. No pictures, nothing, just a sentence. And then we were allowed to do, you know, a bit more and then hashtags and then video and all those kind of things. And I like it for events. I like it for networking. I like it for keeping up. I love that, what you just said, keeping up with my community. And it was just an easy, very quick place to go to get stuff or check in. Are you going to this event? I'm stoked. Get these tickets. Listen to me speak. Those That kind of stuff. And I don't do that anywhere else. Maybe I will do it if I'm going to not be on Twitter for some reason. Maybe I should do, be doing it more in my Instagram stories. Now I can schedule them. Or um, I should be doing it maybe more on LinkedIn. But LinkedIn to me is like a heavier, I sit down, I strategize, I'm there for, I'm, I'm there for my community and, and that, but it's, it's a bigger deal for me to be on LinkedIn, whereas Twitter was just like, I don't need to think about it. I'm glad that I'm not the only one in the way that that's how I literally feel whenever I kind of get on the platform. And I find maybe it's just me getting to my own head. It could be also a case that I think we also come from a generation before we get to something that you found and going back to the praise burger, our generations maybe are the ones that actually experienced LinkedIn when it was <laughs> incredibly stuffy, so to speak. Uh, yesterday, time of recording, we had the first session of our four day intensive. So it's four days, like four classes. And yesterday was showing a LinkedIn ad, actually, as an example, we were talking about what drives your audience. And one of the students wrote, I didn't know LinkedIn was this cool. <laughs> And it made me realize that LinkedIn is, is trying to change slightly the narrative. It's trying to be more about creators, about conversations, about stories. But for some of us, it's not how we experienced it at first, like 10 years ago. And so you, I think for a lot of people, it's still kind of understanding how to bridge that gap between that personalized approach that now it wants us to have. So that's kind of how I feel. And that's why I resonate with what you're saying. And it kind of speaks home and brings it home to me. It's interesting to see what's going to happen, both from just Twitter itself and also where people are going to start moving and how they're going to start looking at the strategy. I generally think by the end of the year, there's going to be a shift unless literally everything magically changes, which again, unlikely. Now, free sandwich, let's bring something good or burger. Um, there's something that is happening, something that arrived in the UK. Emma, tell us what arrived. Let us know. It's nothing that you're all, any of you are going to be shocked about. Um, and I thought, I when I read it, I was actually, oh, do we not already have this? So Meta Verified has come. It is in the UK. So another subscription service where you can pay monthly to have the blue check mark, the verification, the apparently extra features, which comes with more reach and support and things. Um, I went to through to do it. So at the moment, I don't know if it's just me and they don't like me, but um, I was sent like a landing page for you have to be added to a wait list. So while it is here, you can click through to pay and subscribe. You can do it on your desktop. Um, and yeah, there's a wait list. So you can add your name. And then if you want to pay the nine pounds, whatever it is a month, you get meta verified. So again, it's a controversial one. I understand that people will really want this. I think for some people, brands, creators, those really diving into Meta, Facebook in particular, this is really good because they're going to want this and that £9 a month, they'll get ROI on that. I'm, I've said this to you before, Fab, I'm all about organic and I'm all about testing loads of stuff. So I will not be paying for this. Um, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing until there comes a point where I might not be given a choice because that's personally how I feel about all these verification subscriptions. So you've got Instagram verified, now Meta verified, you've got Twitter blue. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm a bit like there's probably going to come a point where you have to have it. Otherwise, you're not going to have another choice. So I think it's great for some. It's not for me right now, um, but yeah. I think I think people that have it, I think it, it was inevitable it was going to happen. They announced it for Instagram. Uh, Twitter Blue is just, you know, doubling down on all the features that they're providing to those that pay the subscription. And Meta, while well, they have a little list of five or six things, they'll just keep adding more. So I don't know how you feel about it. Will you be paying for it? Absolutely not. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. And I'm going to put, there's another hat coming out. 
Dun, 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 controversial hat. You brought, you brought yours too. So I yeah. had a controversial hat on. You can imagine whichever hat you want us to imagine on. I always like, this came from Becca's episodes. We always had hats. So controversial hat on. I don't know why it looks like this. If you're watching on YouTube, it looks weird, but there it is. I personally think that it goes back to my little rant earlier. Some platforms just knew how to monetize when it came. Like LinkedIn was like, we're going to monetize for companies mainly. Because companies need people, need obviously not just clients, but they also need obviously new, you know, new workforce talent. We can monetize on courses because they're looking for professional development. TikTok knows, not saying that they haven't made mistakes, especially TikTok, you know, with like revenue streams and revenue sharing with creators. They have made their mistakes, but they also said it makes sense for us to monetize when it comes to the creators because they're the biggest driver on the platform. I'm not saying again, and this will change, but you can see that these platforms already had a relatively strong pool that they knew where to kind of go to for this. And part of me is wondering whether again, with the idea of like, you know, we've been going too fast. So we haven't been thinking about it from a business perspective in the clearest way possible. LinkedIn, it seems even more obvious with the verification because it was like, it was basically monetizing out of thin air for a very long time. And then Meta, obviously, you could argue that despite the ads and despite all of that, the the platform was growing, but it wasn't really kind of, you know, think about the metaverse, which now is a bit like of a question mark. So I see it as, to me, it just feels like a way to be like, what can we monetize? What can we get people to commit to? And so for me, it goes against what social platforms should be and are, which is a free tool for you to talk about yourself and make connections There should be social as well as media. The media piece is the content you create. The social is the fact that you can connect with people. If you gateway the social side of it, going a bit bit heated right now, then it doesn't become a social media platform anymore. It becomes an elitist club. I don't want to be part of that elitist club. I would rather be able to connect with people and connect with less people. If you have the choice and you are allowed to make that choice and you get some extras, totally fine. But there is that Point that could potentially go down to what you just said and go to that level of like you have no more choice and if I don't have any choice then it might not be the platform that I want to be on and I think a lot of people are starting to realize that it's like like the re- resurgence of longer form content of content that you know on most perspectives like this content you know it's just kind of that's how I feel and it's a bit bittersweet because I wouldn't want to go like get out of Instagram fully or places like this but I'm like well then you know If I have to, then I'd rather leave that platform and focus my efforts on other places where I can focus on my networking. Because that's the thing. They shouldn't gatekeep that element of the connection piece. But what can you do at the end of the day? That's the problem, you know? Too eated? Too much? (laughs) Okay, I'm going to do another sandwich. So basically, this is becoming like a double-decker sandwich. I'm going to bring something else that is interesting. I'm not sure if it's positive or negative. But today I wanted to bring one more piece of news, which is actually still about meta but it's about ads and how they're starting talking about monetization to add and test different ways to actually bring AI into the ad creation through their sandbox. So they are testing some generative AI capabilities that will help advertisers create better campaigns. And there are three features they're kind of testing right now. One is text variation. I say hallelujah, because actually helps you getting different versions of your ad copy based on what you created bit less interesting, but still cool. Uh, background generation. So you can actually create different backgrounds, images from text, which could be interesting for variation purposes. And also image auto cropping, which that could also be really useful. And I think the way that this would be, would be like decent cropping, not just literally cropping, but actually make sure that everything fits within the different ratios of stories and reels. It's interesting because it can allow you to actually create multiple ads faster and in little time with less manual effort. And this could be great, especially as a marketer or social media, you know, kind of person that might deal with different accounts or clients. I don't know how and where it's going to go, but it's interesting to see that Meta is investing time in ads first to actually test its AI capabilities and kind of how it's doing it. Because obviously we see other platforms dabbing into that for different features. And I think Meta in this way, Meta actually understand one of the pain points that was going to be there, which was when it comes to ads, it can become quite a tedious process. I still would like them to make the business uh, manager side, if anybody Meta is listening, a bit easier for everybody. Is it just me? It's just like, I've been doing this for like 15 years now, almost 16. 
God damn it, the business manager is still my nightmare. Every single time he changes, I am terrified. Is it just me? <laughs> no, it is not just you. You're not alone. It is, I think business manager is the most despised piece of something that's been made. Everyone hates it. I don't know anyone who loves it. <laughs> okay, that's that's fair. I actually have a question about, not about a business manager. Uh, I wish we could answer those questions, but I have a question about ads as well, because it made me re- reflect about Again, also where ads are going when it comes to kind of meta and Instagram talking about monetization. And from your perspective, I've seen a lot more ads from a lot more different type of people coming through. And I'm kind of wondering whether there has actually been a bit of a resurgence and whether that is going to become oversaturation. And I wanted to hear kind of how you've been experiencing it, or maybe I'm just going to, I'm, I'm kind of in the crowd where everybody targets these kind of people. And where do you see that going forward for the rest of the year? Because I think ads have had some big ups and downs this year. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I think Facebook ads has always had ups and downs. And then there's been huge peaks and big troughs where people were, were going off it. They were making it so hard to use the platform. Then there was a massive, even pre-COVID and then COVID kicked it off, a massive uh, boost in those switching from social media managers to Facebook ad specialists. And while I love all those new features, I think They're amazing for really small businesses or individual creators who can't afford to pay an agency or an ads manager and they want to do it themselves. And they don't quite know the skills about testing and different content. I, I, I think that's going to be absolutely brilliant. Unfortunately, the circles that, that you and I are in online, I am being served an enormous amount of ads to do with the industry that, that we work in. And I don't. I'm seeing more than I normally would. And yes, I think it is slightly oversaturated, but I think so many people are now lacking the reach and engagement organically from their socials that they're almost finding like, I've got no choice. I'm going to throw £10 a week or whatever they have at some ads. So I I do think that's good. They are going to reach reach more people. Um, And clearly people are doing the right targeting if you and I are being served up. But it's, you know, I don't need a social media manager, but thanks. (laughs) <laughs> I love it. That, that generally doesn't sound like they're actually targeting the right person, though. But it's interesting, though, because I, 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 it's one of those things, again, where you start kind of going through your content and then you feel what is going on, like, where is where are my actual people? And that's, again, where we understand that this is a need for the platform. But then the more you go away from what the platform used to be, things evolve and that is totally fine. But then, as you say, if we're looking to find what our people are up to and it's really hard for us to get there, that's where we step back or we step away from those. So I think it's going to be a very fine balance for the remainder of the year to see how things are going to develop as well. I want to finish on a high note with actually a little snippet from our conversation. We had the lovely panel. We had spring teachers. We had three teachers teaching amazing workshop last week for the school. All of these actually are now on our course library. So if you want to access it and you're in the course library, excellent. If you're not in the course library, you can just go to allmarketingschool.com slash courses. And I wanted to get a little snippet because we had the amazing Veronique, Sean and David, and we had a lot of conversations around creating a timeless brand. And I think today's chat has been so relevant around this, talking about all the changes and, you know, having to adapt based on what platforms are doing. And what we talked about last week is really kind of addressing some of these fears and challenges and talking about things that we can do to still control how to expand our brand, how to show up and how to get to connect with people without having always to rely on something else. And I think as a marketer as well, that sometimes can feel the pressure is like, I want to, you know, get organic reach. I want to connect. I want to bring brand awareness but you feel that you need to find the right tools where you can rely on that organic support and actually that word of mouth and that trust without always having to kind of be on edge, depending on what Elon does next or whoever. Sorry, Elon. Sorry. We got it with you today. Um, So I'm going to, I'm going to leave you with a little snippet before we close down today. Go and have a listen. And obviously if you want to find out more, just go to our course library and you can access this panel and our three amazing workshops that happened last week. That. Sean, what about yourself? I'm sure you consume a lot of stories <laughs> with a lot of newsletters and a lot of newsletters operators that you know, and you definitely can recognize good ones. So from your experience also in the past, what were some of the things that jump out at you? Yeah, so I, I want to continue along the line of like great stories stick in your, your memory, because uh, I think that that's a, a brilliant point. And for me personally, like this happened 
so clearly when I started to use, um, I don't know if anyone's used the app Blinkist before, and basically they're taking like novels and, and fiction uh, books and sorry, nonfiction books and summarizing them down to kind of 10 minute reads. Um, for me, I, I felt like I was saving a lot of time and I was like, oh, yes, like I can tell everyone I've read like five books this week. But the, the problem was I could never remember uh, a lot of the learnings from these little books that I was reading. And it boiled down to the fact that the, the longer books always had stories. And these stories are always the things that normally stick in your heads. And I think that's so true about um, storytelling and branding as well. And we're back. Wait. And we're back. If you can't see it, I did a shimmy. You are all welcome if you see it on YouTube. Uh, we are back to close down today's chats. Thank you so much, Emma. We brought lots of hats, lots of good, lots of bad, lots of interesting. If people want to chat out a bit more and watch your stories, let's be honest, where should they go? Remind us. The best place to find me is on Instagram. I, um, you can find me at, at Fresh Approach Digital and you want to check out tea and tips. Uh, loads of tips like this with loads of tea, loads of banter, all the burgers. Um, it's live every Friday, 12 o'clock UK time. Make sure you set your reminders for Friday at 12. And remember this podcast comes out at seven. So you get a double burger of awesomeness on a Friday. I mean, you are very welcome. So get all of your social media news on a Friday. You're welcome. You can thank us later. In the meantime, as always, it's been a pleasure to have you, dear listener or watcher. Until next time, class dismissed. <laughs>